THE BURIAL OF THE TITHE BY SAMUEL LOVER PART 2 This was an ample barn, where tables of all sorts and sizes were spread, loaded with viands of the most substantial character, wooden forms, three-legged stools, broken back chairs, etc., etc., were in requisition for the accommodation of the female portion of the company, and the men attended first to their wants with a politeness which, though deficient in the external graces of polished life, did credit to their natures. The eating part of the business was accompanied with all the clatter that might be expected to attend such an affair, and when the eatables had been tolerably well demolished, O'Hara stood up in the midst of his guests and said he should propose to them a toast, which he knew all the boys would fill their glasses for, and that was to drink the health of the king and long life to him, for seeing into the rights of the thing and doing such a power for them and more power to his elbow. This toast was prefaced by a speech to his friends and neighbors upon the hardships of the tithe in particular, spiced with the last taste in life of politics in general, wherein the repeat of the Union and Daniel O'Connell got no inconsiderable figure. Yet in the midst of the rambling address, certain glimpses of good sense and shrewd observation might be caught and the many and powerful objections he advanced against the impost that was to be extinct so soon were put forward with a force and distinctness that were worthy a better speaker and might have been found difficult to reply to by a more accustomed hand he protested that he thought he had lived long enough when he had witnessed in his own lifetime two such national benefits as the Catholic Emancipation Bill and the abolition of tithes. O'Hara further declared he was the happiest man alive that day only in the regard of one thing, and that was that his reverence father, Heli, the priest, was not there amongst them, and certainly the absence of the pastor on an occasion of festivity in the house of a snug farmer is of rare occurrence in Ireland. But you see, said O'Hara, when his reverence heard that it was we were going to do, he thought it could be prettier on his part for to have nothing whatsoever to do with it. In hand, act, or part, and indeed, boys, that shows a great deal of good breeding in Father Healy. This was quite agreed to by the company, and after many cheers for O'Hara's speech and some other toasts pertinent to the occasion, the health of O'Hara as founder of the feast with the usual addenda of long life, prosperity, etc., to him and his was drunk, and then preparations were entered into for the proceedings with the ceremony of the funeral. I believe we have nothing to wait for now, said O'Hara, since you won't have any more to drink, boys, so let us set about it at once and make a clean day's work of it. Oh, we're not quite ready yet, said Larry Lanigan, who seemed to be a sort of master of the ceremonies on the occasion. What's the delay? asked O'Hara. Why, the chief murderers is not arrived yet. What murderers are you talking about, man? said the other. Why, you know at the grand bearing, they have always thief murderers. And there's a pair that I ordered to be brought here for that same Myself doesn't know anything about murners, said O'Hara, for I never seen anything finer than the kinners at a bearing. But Larry's up to the ways of the quality as well as of his own sort. But you wouldn't have kinners for the tithe, could you? Sure, the kinners is to say all good they can of the departed, and more if they can invent it. But sure, the devil a good thing at all they could say of the tithe. Very neat was lies the word telling, and so it would only the throwing away trouble. True for you, Lanigan. Besides, it's likely a grand bearing belonging to the quality to have chief murderers, and you know the tide was a quail, 
to a lord or a king a must for power in a short time the murners as larry called them arrived in custody of half a dozen of larry's chosen companions to whom he had entrusted the execution of the mission these chief murners were two tight proctors who had been taken forcibly from their homes by the lanigan party and threatened with death unless they attended the summons of larry to be present at the bearing their presence was hailed with a great shout and the poor devils looked excessively frightened but they were assured by o'hara they had nothing to fear i depend on you mr o'hara for seeing us safe out of their hands said one of them for the other was dumb from terror so you may was the answer o'hara returned hurt nor harm shall be put on you i give you my word on that devil a harm said larry we only put you into a shoot of clothes that is ready for you, and you may look as melancholic as you please. For it's murder you are to be. Well, honor, said he, addressing O'Hara's daughter, have you got the mitre and vestments ready as I told you? Yes, said honor. Here comes Biddy Mulligan with them from the house, for Biddy herself helped me to make them. And who had a better right? said larry when it was herself that laid it all out complete the whole thing from the beginning and sure enough but it was a bright thought of her faix he'll be the lucky man that gets pity yet you had better have her yourself i think said honor with an arch look at larry full of meaning and it's that same i've been thinking of for some time said larry laughing and returning honor's look with one that repaid it with interest but where is she at all oh here she comes with the dust and mike noonan after her trod trod he's following her about all this morning like a sucking calf i'm afraid mike is going to circumvent me with pity but he'd better mind what he said here the conversation was interrupted by the advance of pity mulligan and mike noonan after her bearing some grotesque imitation of clerical vestments made of coarse sacking and two enormous head dresses made of straw in the fashion of mitres these were decorated with black rags hung fantastically about them while the vestments were smeared over with black stripes in no very regular order come here said larry to the tight proctors come here until we put you into your regiments what are you going to do to us mr lanigan said the frightened poor wretch while his knees knocked together with terror we are just going to make a pair of bishops of you said lanigan and sure that's promotion for you oh mr o'hara said the proctor sure you won't let them tie us up in them sacks do you hear what he calls the elegant vestments we made on purpose for him they are sackcloth to be sure and why not seeing as how that you are to be the chief murners and sackcloth and ashes is what you must be dressed in according to reason here my bog said the rollicking larry i'll be your valley the sham myself and he proceeded to put the dress on the terrified tight proctor oh mr lanigan dear said he don't murder me if you please murder you hurray who's going to murder you do you think i dirty my hands with killing a snake in tight proctor indeed that's true mr lanigan it could not be worth your while here now said larry hold your head till i put the mitre on you and make you a bishop complete but wait a bit trot I was nine for getting the ashes, and that would have been a great loss to both of you, because you wouldn't be right murners at all without them, and the people would think you weren't only pretending. This last bit of Larry's woggery produced great merriment amongst the bystanders, for the unfortunate tight proctors were looking at that moment most doleful examples of wretchedness. 
A large shoal full of turfed ashes was now shaken over their heads, and then they were decorated with their mitres. Toot man, said Larry to one of them, don't trimbly like a dog in a wet sack. Oh, thin, look at him how pale he's turned. The dirty coward that he is, I'll tell you, we're not going to do any hurt. So you needn't be looking in such martial dread. By gore, you're as white as a penthorn of curds in a swift's fist. With many such jokes at the expense of the tight proctors, they were attired in their caricature robes and mitres, and presented with a pair of pitchforks by the way of crossiers, and were recommended at the same time to make hail while the sun shone because the fine weather would be leaving them soon, with many other bitter sarcasms conveyed in the language of ridicule. The procession was now soon arranged, and, as they had their chief mourners, it was thought a good point of contrast to have their chief rejoices as well. To this end, in a large cart, they put a sow and her litter of pigs decorated with ribbons a sheaf of wheat standing proudly erect, a bowl of large potatoes, which, at Honor O'Hara's suggestion, were boiled, that they might be laughing on the occasion, and over this was hung a rude banner on which was written, We may stay at home now. In this card, Hoppy Hooligan, the fiddler, with a piper as a coadjutor, rasped and squeaked their best to the tune of Go to the devil and shake yourself, which was meant to convey a delicate hint to the tides for the future. The whole assemblage of people, and it was immense, then proceeded to the spot where it was decided the tide was to be interred, as the most fitting place to receive such a deposit, and this place was called by what they considered the very appropriate name of the devil's pit. In a range of hills in the neighborhood where this singular occurrence took place, there is a sudden gap occurs in the outline of the ridge, which is stated to have been formed by his sable majesty taking a bite out of the mountain, whether it was a spite of hunger that had made him do so, is not ascertained, but he evidently did not consider it very savory morsel for it is said he spat it out again, and the rejected morsel forms the rock of Cashel. Such is the wild legend of this wild spot, and here was the interment of the tide to be achieved as an appropriate addition to the devil's bid. The procession now moved onward, and as it proceeded its numbers were considerably augmented. Its approach was looked for by a scout on every successive hill it came within sight of, and a wild halloo, or the winding of a cow's horn immediately succeeded, which called forth scores of fresh attendants upon the bearing. Thus their numbers were increased every quarter of a mile they went, until, on their arriving at the foot of the hill which they were to ascend, to reach their final destination, the multitude assembled presented a most imposing appearance in the course of their march. The great point of attraction for the young men and the women was the cart that bore the piper and fiddler, and the road was rather danced than walked over in this quarter. The other distinguished portion of the train was where the two tight proctors played their parts of chief mourners. They were the delight of all the little ragged urchins in the country. The half-naked young vagabonds hung on their flanks, plunk at their vestments, made wry faces at them, called them by many ridiculous names, and an occasional lump of clay was slyly flung at their mitres which were too tempting a cock-shot to be resisted. The multitude now round up the hill, and the mingling of laughter, of singing and shouting, produced a wild compound of sound that rang far and wide. As they doubled an angle in the road, which opened the devil's pit, 
full upon their view, they saw another crowd assembled there, which consisted of persons from the other side of the hills who could not be present at the breakfast, nor join the procession, but who attended upon the spot where the interment was to take place. As soon as the approach of the funeral train was perceived from the top of the hill, the mass of people there sent forth a shout of welcome which was returned by those from below. Short space now served to bring both parties together, and the digging of a grave did not take long with such a plenty of able hands for the purpose. Come, boys, said Larry Lanigan to two or three of his companions. While they are digging the grave here, we'll go cut some sods to put over it when the thieving tide is buried, not for any respect I have for it in particular, but that we may have the place smooth and clean to dance over afterwards, and may I never shuffle the brogue again. If myself and Honor O'Hara won't be the first pair, that will set you a pattern. All was soon ready for the interment. The tight coffin was lowered into the pit, and the shouted, that drained the air was terrific. As they were about to fill up the grave with earth, their wild hurrah that had rung out so loudly was answered by a fierce shout at some distance, and all eyes were turned towards the quarter whence it arose, to see from whom it proceeded, for it was evidently a solitary voice that had thus arrested their attention. Toiling up the hill, supporting himself with a staff, and bearing a heavy load in a wallet slung over his shoulders, appeared an elderly man whose dress proclaimed him at once to be a person who depended on eleemosynary contributions for his subsistence, and many, when they caught the first glimpse of him, proclaimed at once that it was that the road was coming. Tattered the roadway, the very descriptive name that had been applied to this poor creature, for he was always travelling about the highways. He never rested even at night in any of the houses of the peasants who would have afforded him shelter, but seemed to be possessed by a restless spirit that urged him to constant motion. Of course, the poor creature sometimes slept, but it must have been under such shelter as a hedge or cave or gravel pit might afford, for in the habitation of man he was never seen to sleep, and, indeed, I never knew any one who bad seen this strange thing in the act of sleep. This fact attached a sort of mysterious character to the wanderer, and many would tell you that he wasn't right, and firmly believe that he never slept at all. His mind was unsettled, and, though he never became offensive in any degree from his mental aberration, yet the nature of his distemper often induced him to do very extraordinary things, and whenever the gift of speech was upon him, for he was habitually taciturn, he would make an outpouring of some rhapsody, in which occasional bursts of very powerful language and striking imagery could occur. Indeed, the peasants said that sometimes could make their hand stand on end to hear tatter the road make an oration. This poor man's history, as far as I could learn, was a very melancholy one. In the rebellion of ninety eight, his cabin had been burned over his head by the Germani after every violation that could disgrace his heart had been committed, he and his son, then little more than a boy, had attempted to defend their hut, and they were both left for dead. His wife and his daughter, a girl of sixteen, were also murdered. The wretched father unfortunately recovered his life, but his reason was gone for ever. Even in the midst of his poverty and madness, there was a sort of respect attached to this singular man, though depending on charity for his meat and drink, he could not well be called a beggar, for he never asked for anything, even on the road, 
when some passenger ignorant of his wild history saw the poor wanderer a piece of money was often bestowed to the silent appeal of his rags his haggard features and his grisly hair and beard thus eternally up and down the country was he moving about and hence his name of tatter the road it was not long until the old man gained the summit of the hill but while he was approaching many were the wonders that in the name of fortune could have brought tatter the road there and by that said one he's pulling foot of a great rate and it's wonderful how an old cop like him can clamber up the hill so fast Aj, said another and with the weight he's carrying too sure enough said a third fix he's got a fine love in his wallet to-day whisht said o'hara here he comes and his ears are as sharp as needles and his eyes too said a woman lord be good to me did you ever see poor tatter's eyes look so terrible bright afore and indeed this remark was not uncalled for for the eyes of the old man almost gleamed from under the shaggy brows that were darkly bent over them as with long strides he approached the crowd which opened before him and he stalked up to the side of the grave and threw down the ponderous wallet which fell to the ground with a heavy crash you were going to close the grave too soon were the first words he uttered sure when the tide it wasn't buried what more have we to do said one of the bystanders Ash, you have put the tide in the grave but will it stay there why indeed said larry lanigan i think he be a bold resurrection man that would come to rise it i have brought you something here to lie heavy on it and it will never rise more said the maniac striking forth his arm fiercely and clenching his hand firmly and what have you brought us akra said o'hara kindly to him look here said the other unfolding his wallet and displaying five or six large stones some were tempted to laugh but a mysterious dread of the wild being before them prevented any outbreak of mirth god help ye creature said a woman so loud as to be heard he has brought a bag full of stones to draw up at the tides to keep them down oh wish wish a poor creature ah oh, stones said the maniac but do you know what the stones these are look woman and his manner became intensely impressive from the excitement even of madness under which was acting look i say there is not a stone there that's not a curse ay a curse so heavy that nothing can ever rise that falls under it oh i don't want to say against it dear said the woman the maniac did not seem to notice her submissive answer but pursuing his train of madness continued his address in his native tongue whose figurative and poetical construction was heightened in its effect by a manner and action almost theatrically descriptive you all remember the window dancy the first choice of her bosom was long gone but the sound she loved was left to her and her heart was not quite lonely and at the widow's heart there was still a welcome for the stranger and the son of her heart made his choice like the father before him and the joy of the widow's house was increased for the son of her heart was happy and in due time the widow welcomed the fair-haired child of her son to the world and a dream of her youth came over her as she saw the joy of her son and her daughter when they kissed the fair-haired child but the hand of god was heavy in the land and the fever fell hard upon the poor and the widow was again bereft for the son of her heart was taken and the wife of his bosom also and the fair-haired child was left an orphan and the widow would have laid down her bones and died but for the fair-haired child that had none to look to but her 
and the widow blessed God's name and bent her head to the blow, and the orphan that was left to her was the pulse of her heart, and often she looked on his pale face with a fearful eye, for health was not on the cheek of the boy, but she cherished him tenderly. But the ways of the world grew crooked to the lone woman, when the son, was the staff of her age, was gone, and one trouble followed another, but still the widow was not quite destitute, and what has it brought the heavy stroke of distress and disgrace to the widow's door? The tide! The widow's cow was driven and sold to pay a few shillings, the drop of milk was no longer in the widow's house, and the tender child that needed the nourishment wasted away before the widow's eye, like a snow from the ditch, and died, and fast the widow followed the son of her heart and his fair-haired boy. And now the home of an honest race is a heap of rubbish, and the bleak wind whistles over the heart where the warm welcome was ever found, and the cold frog crouches under the ruins. These stones are from that desolate place, and the curse of God that follows oppression is on them, and let them be cast into the grave, and they will lie with the weight of a mountain on the monster that is buried for ever. So saying, he lifted stone after stone, and flung them fiercely into the pit's den, 